Yes, good evening. Um, good to be back at the BSA. As I said, it was like 2020 was the plan. You know, I was here in November 2019 thinking uh, I'll be back in a few months, and it's been a while. Um, but Richard, you haven't lost anyone here, so that's the good news. Um, on the other hand, I have, <laughs> and that's bad news. Um, anyway, so uh, as Robert said, uh, this is, I'm, this, I'm no great at it. Uh, don't ask me specific questions about Claude so and so or Brando. It's not my role. It's more about what the building science implications are of uh, a program like Brado and the stretch code and the uh, special co specialist code are going to drive significant needs that we're not used to dealing with. Um, now, all construction is going to change in Massachusetts. And I think, in a way, that's the point. Right, uh, and uh, but first you have to accept that the way we are, have been building and renovating buildings may not be leading to the outcomes that everybody would like. Um, and particularly when I talk about everybody's regulators and the societal level, we're saying, hey, we got to do something. Uh, and so that's uh, why we're making these changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit at the big picture about some of the issues about why we're making changes and how the building industry that we're in are connected to those big changes. And then I want to dive into some of the uh, little details that my fellow nerds care about when it comes to specifying materials and coming into the details for building the building. So, um, right start. So, uh, this is about retrofit in, in particular, but some of it's going to apply very much to new construction. So why would we want to retrofit a building? Well, because we want to improve the comfort of the building, we want to save energy, we want to reduce impact on the environment. We want to preserve the history that we have in all the wonderful buildings. And you can hear the crescendo, the, the sound of music in the background as I tell these things, or it's because I got to because the law made me. And, uh, and part of all of those other reasons we're all about it. And we have been renovating existing buildings, whether they're 300 years old or 12 years old, you know, for as long as Massachusetts has been a commonwealth. So, uh, but it's now, we're not, it's not going to be as much a choice. You're going to have to, you're going to have to do something and it's going to cost you lots of money one way or the other. When I say you, I mean building owners. So, you know, it's good to be real estate for you because this is not going to cost you anything. <laughs> um, but if you do own buildings, uh, it's going to cost money one way or the other. Uh, and whether it's a lot of money or a little, I can't be sure. And I don't think anybody is. We just know that we have to make changes. So let me talk a little bit of Brado building, oops, <laughs> spelled it wrong way. <laughs> it's B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-R-B-E-
This is the same result that's coming out of almost every every jurisdiction I know of that has been doing these reporting laws. London, UK was the first that I know that then spread to all of Britain. Um, but we actually see this at a national level. We see this at local level. Is that it, you know it really doesn't matter what the age of the building is, and regulators who are some of them, believe it or not, actually quite concerned about the climate crisis and saying, what are we going to do about it? are saying clearly our building codes are not achieving the desired outcome. So uh, I think it's really important to understand the backdrop. This isn't a policy that's meant to punish building owners uh, or it's some you know police state overreach. It is a direct and logical outcome of the last 35 or more years of building regulations. Now what's coming is that in 2.0 there is now a plan where, depending on your building type, assembly, college, education, food sales, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to disparage people who are in multifamily just saying blah, blah, blah for, at all. Um, is that there are these targets for emissions, which are, as usual in our industry, a beautiful combination of metric mass units and uh, imperial square footage units with Latin gear units. Okay, so, so you know, par for the course, and, and, a, and a big part of our business in, in the building science community is to fudge in between all these freaking units because no one can be considered. Okay. So, but whatever, what it says is that there are numbers that we have to meet starting in 2025 in each of these categories. And they'll know how you meet them by the fact that we have this great system in America where every month a whole army of people spread out across the land and they collect meter readings from every building around. And then they write it down and send owners a bill. And so we have always, since the post war period, had excellent information about how much energy buildings use. It's just nobody shared them with anybody. And so it was difficult to turn that into actionable information. And so what these types of laws, uh, Berto and also Local 197, et cetera, do is that they, they make it transparent and clear. Yep, you get those bills, you submit them to the city with your tax return, or you take a lot of money away and you do out of I, I didn't look at the punishment clauses because, of course, I always obey rules. Um, now, these emissions numbers are based on assumptions of how much carbon is emitted if you use a certain amount of energy in these building types. Um, now, those assumptions are going to be part of your submission to say, okay, well, how much carbon do you really emit based on your building's mix of natural gas, electricity, fuel oil, burning used car tires, and so on. And each of those energy sources has a amount of carbon emitted per amount of heat delivered, right? That kind of thing. And so regardless of whether you're a good citizen or not, in 2030, if you have a food sales and service building, you have to be able to achieve a carbon emission of lower than 10.9 kilograms of CO2 per square foot per year, um, or you have to pay a penalty of some sort. That's the, the simplest level, right? And the, the penalty is, is actually quite interesting. It's $235 per, that's US dollars, per metric, not US ton of, of CO2. Uh, and that's the reason I find that number interesting is that in, in, the, in New York, they passed the law, it was $215. I don't know why carbon is twenty dollars more per ton in Boston, but I'm sure it makes for a discussion some of the time. But it's also how we would describe this in terms of carbon pricing. Will we call this a shitload of money? Uh, because normally we talk about carbon emission uh, offsets being in the order of like fifteen to fifty dollars a ton uh, as being kind of ordinary things you do. So part of the, I'm guessing, part of the reason they set this high number was to make it worth your while. You're going to do something about it because this is going to be painful, right? So this has nothing directly to do with the new stretch code, right? And whether this is an existing or a new building, they have to meet the same thing. Now the stretch code doesn't say I have to fix the enclosure of the building uh, that we're in or across the street. 
um, because the code doesn't apply to existing buildings unless you make significant changes. But this is a bunch of no changes. This just says, if you exist as a building, you need to reduce your emissions. And it doesn't say that you can't just turn off the air in the summertime to meet those carbon emissions. Now, the tenants may have other points of view, uh, but what they do care about is what are the carbon emissions and we have to figure out what to do with them. And that's why I think there's a pretty significant change in how we're going to look at existing buildings. They are a major part of the emissions of Massachusetts and all of America. Um, and this is actually, has, it's in a way, very simple, maybe too simple. We can talk about the limitations of the discussion period, but it's making a very clear statement. Yeah, we're going to have to reduce emissions and without fear or fa favor or fear, I don't know how that legal term works, without fear or favor, it doesn't matter if it's a new building or it's an old building, it's like you just got to meet the numbers. Now, there are, of course, exceptions for historic buildings, there's some exceptions for affordable housing, and what those are, I can't quite tell. It sounds like you should talk to someone senior about that. That's sort of how I read the thing. Well, there's a committee, and you'll make a good argument, and we'll believe you. Um, so I can see that being real fun. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so energy codes, as I think all of us know, have been on this steep downward trend of energy by calculation consumption of buildings. First, Commercial energy code in America was actually 90.1 in 1975. 1975, because that's how long it took Ashley to make a standard after the 1973 oil crisis. For those of you who weren't born in 1973, look it up on Wikipedia. So um, they made the standard and they didn't change it for a long time. In 1980, they polished up the language so it was enforceable by law. Um, they really made the first change in 1989 where they reduced energy supposedly by about 12%. And then they reduced it again, a few tweaks. And then, then lately they've been picking up speed trying to reduce it. And it's supposed to be, if you met even the 2013 standard, you'd be down at about 40% less than the 1973 bill. How do they come up with charts like this? Well, they come up with it, you know, what would you do? Well, you could build a whole bunch of buildings to various codes, and then you could measure the meter readings over the years to see which ones use less. That would be a really good experiment, but really expensive. That's not how we do it. So instead, we make up a fairy world. It's called computer modeling. And, uh, and so we actually get into usually a darkened room with a glowing screen, and we enter a whole bunch of inputs that we guess at. And when you put in about 60 to 80 guesses, you can then push a button and it produces very attractive graphs that are completely convincing to the public. Um, and then you say, oh, well, if I do that under the old standard and the new standard, look, the energy goes down. And the crowd applauds and we move on to the next code cycle. And then we look at the results and say, huh, doesn't seem like our buildings are using less energy. So the committee gets together again and say, well, let's turn a few more knobs. We'll add things like continuous insulation instead of just insulation. And we'll add things like later in the cycle, they would do things like air barriers, ridiculous stuff. Uh, and then they would like, change the numbers on the air conditioner, the chiller, and they would have, you had to buy, it can't be total crap. Now you can just buy crap. And then the most recent one is like, okay, kind of crap. And, and so as they moved the not needles, the computer models came back and said, look, we're saving energy. And the regulators looked at the energy numbers that all of these people who spread out every month throughout the land and collected the meter readings and they're saying, but the numbers aren't going down. And so regulators are getting to the point of WTF, you know, where's the foreman? Uh, and they don't know why these things don't connect, but I think in particular, we're seeing this in this jurisdiction and others, they're saying enough. We're now gonna just say results matter. It's the number that you deliver based on what goes through the meter is whether or not you met the quote. I have to say, this is a dramatic and profound shift for 200 plus years of professional design Building designers and constructors have not been held to that standard. 
I mean, you know, you could build in lots of safety factors, for example, so it didn't fall down. Uh, and you can build in lots of safety factors, you don't exceed. But realistically, we've not really had a lot of these uh, standards that held ourselves. Even in structural engineering, lots of stories to be told about how we learned about hurricane resistance by changing the code, hurricane rolls through, oh, which roofs fell off this time, which windows blew out. Well, well how about we change all of them? Next hurricane, not as many roofs blew off. Good job. And so then we kept tweaking, right? And we're essentially we were trying to do this with the energy side, except every time we tweak the knobs, nothing effing happened. So now you may say I'm just making this stuff up, and partly you might be right. But this is actually out of a great uh, summary. If you want to uh, look for, by summary, it's, it is 60 pages long. But relative to the amount of information that's out there on Alberto and the new codes, this is actually pretty condensed. Um, and so they took a lot of the data that was collected, and this is its purpose, is to say, let's analyze it and see how it affects what we should do with regular tech. And you'll see um, on the vertical axis here is uh, the amount of uh, uh, emissions of carbon, vertical axis. Each of these boxes is a different category of occupants. This year, education, you know, it's my favorite because I spent a lot of time in that business. Um, but there's lodging, which is also a favorite of mine because I do a favorite consulting. Um, but I don't care too much about offices because they spend very little time there. But that's what they have all of these things. Um, and you'll see that the lines are from left to right are carbon emissions by year of construction. And you can obviously see that there is a dramatic reduction in carbon emissions over the years as codes kicked in. <laughs> Actually, you can see nothing off the bottom. Um, and I like this graph because it shows a lot of stuff, although it's probably not a great graph for presentations because you probably can't see all the details. Uh, but, you know, all of these lines are just saying, you know, okay, these people are on drugs, but, you know, there's not much going on uh, in terms of carbon emissions. The only group, shockingly, the only group that shows a significant reduction in emissions is retail. You know why? Because ASHRAE building codes, et cetera, actually tell you how much lighting energy you're allowed to put in a building. And it's not based on modeling. How do I know how whether you install 10 watts per square foot of lighting, 5 watts, or 20? It's a, it's a technique I pioneered. It's called walking around and looking. Walk. It's a W A A L. So you look up and you count, okay, 32 watts, 32. today it will be 28 watts, 28 watts, 28 watts. It's not that hard. In fact, it's blindingly obvious, especially if you look too long at it. And so you know, the target has been reduced. And in retail, we went from standard 50 watts per square foot lighting in high-end retail. And now we're routinely at 10 or 5. Well, look, the numbers went down because we had an actual energy use that we could easily track and therefore regulate. So when we're trying to reduce uh, carbon emissions, whether it's new or retrofit, we have a number of options. One of the things that we like to talk about is you can reduce the need for energy, that you know, energy connected in some way to carbon. We can also do a better job of using the energy we use. It kind of makes sense, right? It basically means that I need less energy because to do the same thing, I need less energy. And then I can also reduce the amount of carbon that's emitted by the energy I do use. So it seems very straightforward. Now, the reason I show this is in inverted pyramid, it's an excellent arrangement, not a different story, um, is that this is the most important way we look at things when we're designing a new building. So the first thing is put in good insulation and air tightness and try and uh, avoid the need for energy. Then we start saying, okay, put in more efficient equipment so that the heating and cooling and lighting is done with the least amount of energy needed. And then of course we might do something about low carbon electricity, depending on how serious you are. Now, if you're serious or you have good credits, uh, you will put PV on them, right? So because Walmart cares deeply about the planet, mm -hmm. lots of their stores have photovoltaic panels on, right? And so they can also reduce uh, this number as well. In retrofits, and, or let me just say in existing buildings, 
it's almost the inverse in terms of bank or buyer. Not that many people want to hear this. <laughs> um, but the first way to reduce carbon is like, don't buy electricity from the Massachusetts grid because it's kind of a mediocre high carbon grid. Now there are worse, you know, South Dakota burns the newest coal they can find. It looks more like dirt. Yeah. Uh, and that way it emits more carbon per unit energy than anything else they can come up with. Um, so yeah, that's worse than Massachusetts. Um, but, you know, places like, um, I don't know, Quebec, you know, there's, that's a problem in Canada, it's kind of north of here, it's like, they have all this hydropower, uh, massive areas of land they flooded, and so it's like the carbon emissions there are like, meaning, but that's a, a unit of measurement, but maybe it's Canadian, you don't know, but it's very small, it's very small. Um, so if you want an actual number, it's something in the order of seven to 10 pounds of CO2 uh, per thousand megawatt hours of point zero seven pounds, which is about half as much as a photovoltaic panel, a typical photovoltaic panel in Massachusetts. Uh, how does a PV panel make CO2? Well, you know, you know they have to make it up to something, right? <laughs> so the PV panels have this physical manifestation uh, which is like aluminum and glass and a logic mat, a lot of magic silicon stuff with some copper wires and all the stuff. So you put, if you add the carbon emissions in that, you get numbers that are like twice the Quebec grid. But but Massachusetts is about five times the BB net or ten times the Quebec grid, right? So we can do, we could put BB panels on our roofs and really reduce it. And if I own an existing building like a Walmart that doesn't already have PV panels on it, it seems like that would be a pretty obvious thing to do in terms of bang for buck. This is why it's quite different under Erdo than it is under the stretch code, which doesn't say that. The stretch code says, look, you've got to meet these energy targets, whatever. Whereas you have the option under an existing building to say, how am I best going to reduce my carbon emissions? Because after I buy, you can also like, it's sort of like buying indulgences, right? You can also buy purchase power agreements with people uh, who will uh, cover up productive farmland in upstate New York with big PV panels. And then you can use that to reduce your carbon. Just suggesting with my side remarks that there may be some, you know, countervailing benefits and disbenefits here. So the other thing you could do is use energy more efficiently. So I have this building here. Uh, or an, an existing building across the street. Well, one of the obvious things, right, Maria, is to actually swap out the mechanical systems. Because one of the things about mechanical systems, they're actually designed by mechanical engineers who are clearly inferior designers to architects because their shit only lasts 20 years or so, right? And then it falls apart, right? So architects routinely make it to 35. Um, so, so, so especially if you've got rooftop units and such, which were used to just meet the code at the time they were installed, they're not very efficient, they're not very durable. There's a lot of economic incentive to say, but I call them what we're square as uh, Andrews. Uh, I was I call it swap the boxes, right? And actually, if you get it at the right time, it might be 15 years old or 22 years old. There's an actually a big economic argument to swap the boxes for something that is a more efficient. Or and or lower carbon, right? So those options, like you might have a natural gas rooftop unit for heating, pretty common in Massachusetts. Um, what's starting to show up are heat pump uh, rooftop units. Not as easy as you might think. Ask me how I know, but there are projects where that could slot in. So that could be an obvious choice for existing buildings. However. If you look ahead at where the, the line is going for carbon emissions of your building type, and you ask how long will this mechanical system last and how much will it cost, it often will make sense to also do something about reducing the need for energy in the building itself, because if you have to replace 17 12-ton rooftop units with 17 heat pumps that deliver 12 tons it's going to be much more expensive. And in fact, it's sometimes difficult to buy equipment. And so it's pretty obvious that you do something to reduce the need. And that might be, again, very simple. How about you shut the door 
Uh, yeah, so there are lots of buildings that have holes in them the size of a, of a large shipping door when you do a blower door. That's you know, we used to do this in the old days, right? Convert to square feet or whatever, so that you can actually tell someone, how big is my house? 18 square feet. What? That got people's attention, right? Now, now if you say, oh, it's 0.47 CFM per square foot, they go, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you have to pick your audience carefully as to what your what units you're using. And, and so air sealing of a lot of these existing buildings is often like really low hanging fruit. The window, the, the lighting, for example, is often 90% of the way there. We're, we're now far enough along that it's very likely that that building, that existing building has had a light exchange in the last 10 to 15 years, and there hasn't been as much of a big chance. But you can do something, right? And then the next obvious thing is like, well, the windows. Uh, and, you know, windows, uh, well, they're a pain. Uh, and hopefully you can make them double. <laughs> they leave for four years and they turn into a bunch of bunch. <laughs> anyway, so but windows are obviously non trivial, right? They're expensive and they often involve having to speak to a building enclosure consultant. And those people are different, you know, and, and they're expensive and, you know, it's annoying. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, and so windows, roof replacement, depending on the, if you, if there's still lots of R10 roofs out there that haven't been replaced yet, that could totally be immediately switched to R30 and there's good bang for buck in that. Um, and so my assumption is, is that rational people will be following these sort of patterns. And as they look at their existing building and ask, what are the things I do? Starting with, how do I get lower carbon uh, energy supply? How do I swap the boxes at the right time? Look at the chart as to when do I fall off the cliff? And when is this piece of shit going to fail, right? So it's like that sort of knife edge design decision that developers love. And then you can also uh, start working on when I'm going to change the box. And I, and I think that's important is that it doesn't mean that you change the box without reducing the need for energy. Because it's usually good bang for buck at that time to save mechanical equipment capacity and open up technology options that are available, like air source heat pumps, by reducing the demand accordingly. So this is where we have to start doing some interactive discussions uh, on individual projects. So I mentioned this. Bruno is all about carbon. Really, and uh, so space heating, cooling, and ventilation use energy, and that uses carbon. Right? I think everyone's got that dot connected together. You're not in the center. So then we have things like the enclosure and mechanical equipment, which are together meeting that load. Right. So you can either reduce the need for space heating, cooling with a good enclosure, or you can reduce the energy required by using good mechanical. And the normal answer is we use a bit of both, and you try and find that magic balance. Um, but if you're in certain building types like uh, multifamily, um, and we call those multi unit residential buildings in Canada because in Canada you don't have to be a family to live in those buildings. <laughs> and so uh, it's one of those things I've never really understood about America. But the domestic hot water can be a significant number, particularly if it's a reasonably well built building. In fact, one of the metrics is that if you've got a good multifamily building, it means that your domestic hot water load is significant. And part of the challenge to that is like, well, how are we going to meet that domestic hot water load? Because it's different and there's fewer options available for like heat pumps. Uh, uh, how do you meet the domestic hot water load in a hotel or in a multifamily or a, a dorm residence with a heat pump in February? It's not so hard to figure out how to do this right now. Uh, open the window. Uh, and you get hot water. <laughs> uh, but in, in January, yeah, but those technologies are available, just not here, right? So one of the uh, quotes I like from the, one of the, the favorite opera of mine, Neuromancer, said that the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed. And uh, things like CO2 heat pumps are available, but they're not here. But things like Local Law 97, the Washington DC ordinance, or the Massachusetts changes in Boston in particular, 
are likely to build a, a market big enough to make it worth the Japanese selling us really expensive equipment. Uh, you know, I know it's, you think it would be an easy sell, but mm, really, do I want to get a UL rating? You know, uh, anyway. so I think that they'll do really well once they realize the scale of the marketplace because there's a big need. There are technologies, and they just have to roll them out. Uh, it's just, it's just not. We're not quite there yet on real projects. I can't stack three products to bid on my next residential re not retro. Kind of annoying. Uh, I have to go to Japan, and if they, they won't they let me carry it on my life. So, um, lights, elevators, appliances depends a lot on the building whether they're significant. I mean, appliances by that I mean like flood loads of all types. And certain building types like science and technology, those are huge. Uh, apparently, an aspect spectrometer use a lot of electricity. I don't know. Um, but then the final thing is the uh, I want to point out construction and materials, which really I mean the materials. Construction doesn't emit that much carbon. Um, it's really all the material processing and getting it from the original site through the processing plant, all the stuff they do. There. And that's obviously called embodied carbon. And that's not regulated right now. Um, but it's pretty obvious most people are thinking of it, saying the full picture needs to include embodied carbon. And that means that's another reason why retrofit is a good idea. Because a lot of the carbon needed for the building has already been expended. It's uh, no, we don't have to build, build new foundations, which are pretty high carbon components in any building. Most of the structure is in place, so which is the second largest component of carbon in most buildings. And so the retrofit has a strong argument to be made that they're already doing an awful lot for embodied carbon. Uh, so the hope don't blow it in the retrofit, but you know it should be quite feasible to build equivalent square footage for half of what a new building would be, and even more with some more care and attention to the details. That's based on very limited example building. So I mentioned to you that the energy depends on, uh, the carbon emissions depend on the energy. This is the table that was used um, in, the, in the Synapse report that I referenced earlier. These numbers will change, and the committee that, that governs Erdo will tell you what the appropriate ratios are. If you have an argument as to why yours is less or, or different, they will, you can make that application and say, hey, I'm using a combined heat and power, picking up waste energy from the dairy plant down the road, and therefore my carbon emissions are much lower. That, that, that kind of weird uh, edge case. But this is where I wanted to point out that the Zoom thing is covering up the number 87 for grid electricity, which is the highest source of carbon in any of these uh, energy sources right here, right? Uh, but, 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 you know, there's an aspirational goal that the Massachusetts grid will get cleaner every year, just like the traffic in Boston streets is going to get better every year. Uh, yeah, so, no, I, I actually think the grid is going to get cleaner. It's just a natural way forward. But remember that the projections here are that we clean up the grid. And this is why I'm saying that the building industry is actually relying on the power supply and distribution industry to get their ducks in a row, right? Now, I wanted to show a couple other things here. I mentioned space heating and cooling, but this is some of the data you get out of Grado that tells uh, with uh, some, Grado, I keep calling it Grado. Um, Gerdo um, and the energy, the end use emissions on average for heating and cooling is about 40%. So meaning, although I'm an enclosure guy and I like good enclosures, like don't get misdirected to think that all I do is you know insulate the jeepers out of this thing and we're gonna be good because we aren't. Insulating the jeepers out of this thing is a starting point to solving the other 60% of the energy use. So what is the other 60%? Well, you know, the biggest other components tend to be things like lighting, ventilation, and it depends, well, refrigeration, if you're in the food service industry, duh, right? But so that's, there are some pretty obvious areas in, uh, in occupancies, which, but I'm, well, I guess the key takeaway here is that 
It's not all about insulation and airtightness and windows. Um, there's a lot of other aspects, literally half of the other carbon emissions that we also have to deal with and manage. Now, this is the building enclosure council get together. Of course, we all know building enclosures and we know how to solve that problem. Right? I, I don't expect a lot of us have a good way of cutting in refrigeration energy demands in stores by, by, by two thirds. But we do have pretty good answers on how to cut the energy loss for heating and cooling in our buildings by two thirds. And that's pretty straightforward. Turns out that in many cases, it's also the lower cost one. It's not easy to say that retrofit, it's easy to say that in Okay, so now uh, because heating and cooling emissions are not special, uh, it's actually carbon from any energy use, you would be just as uh, interested in reducing server energy. So that would mean for Xbox stations. So like basically make all teenagers homeless will have a big impact on reducing emissions in Massachusetts. Um, so um, the changing grid uh, technology is something that literally in the 10 years or more, I just checked this morning, I have a, my first spreadsheet on carbon emissions in buildings was 2012. Um, so it's been about 11 years. It's literally changing pretty quickly. Uh, when you check what is the grid emissions, um, what are the emissions embodied in foam insulation? What are the grid emissions in concrete? They are changing in meaningful ways on, like I'd say, five-year cycles. So I, I don't expect that to change. But meaning we're going to have to keep up to date on this stuff because some of the advice we would have given you uh, 12 years ago about, oh, you got to avoid extruded polystyrene because it's got terrible global warming gases. It's like, oh, shit, that's not true anymore. And, and because, of course, people who make extruded polystyrene love the planet. Bullshit. It's because the federal government passed a law saying you can't put that shit in your phone. And look, poof, it was like last year, January. Poof, the uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions of extruded polystyrene dropped by a factor of about 25. Because it wasn't possible until the law was passed. And then suddenly it became possible. Um, so, and we're seeing as other products change their energy supply, as they electrify, as they upgrade their uh, production systems, as they change their transportation logistics, they are able to publish their third-party audited carbon emissions and show that, hey, this is 20% lower than it was last time. I think this is fantastic news. It just means a bit of work to keep up with all this stuff. Um, okay, here's, a, here's a, a little bit of a side note that connects to all of this buildings and grid. So this is what's called the duct curve. And that some of you must know the duct curve because you're nerdy enough. Um, but what this is showing is a plot of energy demand in California over a typical day in spring, okay? Um, March to May, 2015 to 2023. The reason they call it a duct curve is apparently they have to see ducts and uh, so that's the back end, and there you see the little head there. You know, it's clearly a donkey. I have no idea, but whatever. Um, so in 2015, look at the line in the middle of the day. The line in the middle of the day was about 25% less than the line in the middle of the night. So if you're a producer of energy, it's like, okay, I got to run flat out at, uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I can relax to 75% at midnight. Now look at the 2023 night, was the darkest one. So, okay, it goes from about 18 in the middle of the, sorry, at the middle of the night. And it drops off to zero at around one o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that? So, so there's so much solar installed on roofs that they don't have any place to put it on a typical spring day in 2023. So that's why they're changing their net metering rules because it doesn't make any sense to net meter when, well, what? You get to use the power when it's available and then you don't? What am I supposed to do with the stuff? Did the, the cost of my plant and my grid get cheaper? No, in fact, it got more expensive. The grid in particular is getting more expensive to handle these 
massive 100 percent variations in so they're having to invest a lot in grids um, so they don't burn down California again. And so that they can actually make them smart to divert power and level out some of these things, et cetera. But the first thing they're going to do is they did what Hawaii has done uh, five, five, seven years ago. They won't let you export PV power anymore. So you can put PV on your roof, but just don't give us that stuff. We don't want that stuff because you're giving it to me when I don't want it. So this is going to happen most places. Now, it's probably not going to get this bad because most places aren't as sunny and did not have as generous subsidies for PVs on roofs. Um, but it's, it's happening in other places. Uh, now, transplant this. This is uh, May, March to May. It's famous in California, but March to May, um, what happens in Massachusetts in the wintertime? If we actually electrify houses and buildings, and we're going to actually use heat pumps with a little bit of electric backup on that, you know, what, uh, four degree, 4 a.m. in January day, it's like the peak is going to happen somewhere in the, you know, around here, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., where the grid is already fully loaded. How much contribution does photovoltaics provide to the grid uh, at 2 to 4 a.m.? You don't have to do any calculations for this particular question. Um, now, you would have to know it is dark outside. <laughs> and so, in this period, if I do this in January, it's dark until 7.30, 8 o'clock, depending on how depressed you are on that particular day. Um, and so, zero PV is produced, and yet those are the peak hours that we are going to demand of our grid. So, what the grid demands of us? Make efficient buildings. Don't be demanding needless amounts of uh, power at 4 a.m. or 2 a.m. That's why regardless of your source of carbon emissions, you have to be able to have a building that doesn't demand too much. Don't be greedy because it's going to screw up the neighbor's ability to also have a heat pump in their house. And by the way, did you hear there are people who are actually driving cars that run on electricity? And they are plugging in at work and at home to charge up said batteries. Wow, I guess that could make this a problem too. Now, lots of really smart people are working on trying to, for example, make sure that when you plug in your car, it only charges in the middle of the day when the sun. Not very healthy for people who have dead batteries at 4 a.m. or 8 a.m., right? It's, oh, it's 8 a.m., I forgot to plug in my car, but I still have to go to work. Shit, right? And I can't plug in because the grid doesn't want to let me? No, you'll probably just pay through the notice. Kind of like that. But anyway, um, whereas if you were to be better planned, you might get your, your power at noon for a quarter or a fifth of the price, right? Half apparently doesn't do it. We know that from small-scale power studies. Cutting the price of electricity in half really has no real major impact on the demand for people who drive cars because it's just we're rich. I mean, people spend four dollars on a freaking coffee. I know it's not Dunkin' Donuts, but Starbucks. Okay, so um, they don't really care whether it costs them four dollars to fill up their car or five seventy five. So you need to take it from four dollars to twenty bucks, and then enough people will switch. And this is connected to buildings because that's why we need buildings that are low load, why we need to build new buildings that don't demand a lot of electricity, and why our renovations of our existing buildings also have to be designed to lower their peak demand. And ideally, they would be designed to be able to say, I know everyone else needs heat at 4 a.m., but because I have a superior building, I'll just wait it out. And we can do that, right? Like, let's say I had like three wise of brick and a concrete floor in my loft apartment. Um, and it was super insulated with really good windows and uh, air tightness. Well, really, who cares? I'll wait a few hours. It's just not a big deal. Um, that's also going to have to be part of what we do. But again, it goes back to we need good building enclosures on almost every one of our buildings, even though we might have lots of free, quote unquote, energy in the middle of the day. We actually, especially in places like Massachusetts, need a lot of it in the middle of the night. And we might need a fair bit of it later in the day, but we'll see, depending on sunshine and so on and so forth. It's a lot, not as bad of it mixed, but 
air conditioning loads are not peak at 11 to, to 2 p.m. They're peak more around 3, 4, 5 p.m. And that's when the PD numbers are already going back. So one of the things I want to have a warning here uh, is that we're starting to see people take care of out of body parts. Uh, and, you know, there's no regulation here, but as usual, the early adopters are seeing the problem coming and saying, hey, we think we should do the right thing. And uh, the problem is, is that people um, often get fixated, right? They get distracted, oh, shiny object, oh, shiny object. Um, and if the shiny object is, on this project, we're going to reduce the, the body carbon, it's like, oh, shiny object. And they forget that they still need to control rainwater penetration, have a good air barrier, meet the fire code, not have the building turn to oatmeal that grows mushrooms. Uh, and so uh, that's that's the warning here is like when we're choosing these materials, make sure that you're making it informed decision about equal durability, equal strength, or sufficient strength. It doesn't have to be equal. It has to be sufficient strength, sufficient durability, sufficient fire resistance, because replacing uh, Robert, I'll pick up an example. Replacing a stone wool back with wood fiber is not a, a one to one replacement. I mean, that is, it's, it is a replacement, but it doesn't mean that it, it's just not our value, right? What about fire? What about the added resistance to water? You may have maybe be surprised to find out when you grind up wood really fine and then keep it wet for a while, it goes bushy and smells funny, like my socks at the end of the day. Um, and so that means that, well, if you're going to do that swap, you actually have to change more of the wall design to allow you to do that. Oh, let's change hollow core precast slabs into CLT. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, when it rains on construction sites, and, and I, one of my things from my experience has been that it often rains during construction. Um, and also that many people build their buildings outdoors. Uh, even people who make prefabricated buildings routinely forget this, right? It's like, oh, it's all built in the factory. No, actually it's not. It's like built in modules and it gets rained on while you're driving into the job site and, and, and before you stuck it on the next module. It's the same thing with CLT. You know, the biggest cause of problems are solutions. And so when we actually have the, you know, a CLT instead of a precast hollow core plank, it changes things. And suddenly, we now thought that it structurally is an equivalent, and we certainly can make it meet these sufficient to fire. Yeah, but what did you think about in terms of construction logic? How are you dealing with plumbing needs? Let's, you know, it's a condo or something like that. Um, because they're not the same. So you now need to do other things in your design and or in your construction process. And this actually affects the constructor more than the design is to say, whoa, and you know, I can't say that I'm telling you this because I'm somehow smart. It's just that I have lots of friends who tell stories. Um, one of them that's bad. But uh, in this case, uh, the, you know, we had lots of people building CLT buildings where it's like, you know, lots of water damage during construction. So you can go to RDH's website and you can download the CLT or Fast Timber, actually, moisture management guide uh, with all kinds of photographs and you know, flow charts about all the different types of mass timber and how sensitive they are. And all of that was born out of the hard experience of other people who didn't read. So you should be one of the ones who reads. And it's uh, better to, to, to learn mistakes from others to avoid them in, the, in, in your life. So this is a, this retrofit and Birdo is really a, a great example of the paradigm shift we're undergoing. Because of all of the conversation I just had with you about the changing energy codes not reaching their targets, measured results of buildings not working, we're moving to a performance-based code system and regulation system. And at the highest level of performance, air tightness isn't, yeah, I put it in air barrier. Air tightness is I went out there with a blower door and I freaking tested it. And a third party agency said it leaks this much to two decimal places. This is how much my building leaks. That's a completely different story, right? And we're doing the same thing with energy and carbon. We're now saying, ah, whatever, ashray, ash, smash, may. What matters is how much energy your building uses. And that is a paradigm shift in design. And that means that we can't do the normal thing about 
bring up a, you know, go through schematic design, design documentation, then do a construction document set, and then do a post mortem energy model to say, holy shit, right? And, and, and even worse, it's going to be like, oh gosh, so we better go that, that modeler. They work for us, right? Now, well, we better tell them that it has to meet the code. Oh, okay. So we tell them it needs the code, and then they, they make adjustments to the model. Uh, until it gives me a code approval. Right? That, that, we've been doing that for the last 20 years. The difference here is that it doesn't matter if they make changes to the model. <laughs> what matters is what actually got built and how much energy it actually uses. So that whole idea about using models to provide papering over the fact that the building isn't that great, uh, is it going to work anymore? I think this is a huge deal uh, because now we actually have a measurable outcome. And that means that the design has to think about energy and carbon in just like we think about dollars and cents. We have a budget. We know at the very beginning of our project what that budget is, you know, roughly speaking, right? Is this a $250 square foot project, 400, 800, 1200, leap skin territory? Uh, and when you know that, you immediately can make selections about what you're doing with respect to the consultants you need, whether you can do an all curtain wall building or you can use terracotta cladding with custom cut marble, whatever. Um, well, at 250, you can. Well, what the codes, both the stretch code for new and Bruno is telling you for existing is that no, you have to make choices that up front you must know that this is a low carbon solution and you can't do the high carbon one. Or if you do the high carbon solution, you're gonna have to trade it off over here on something else. So like uh, the example of using, well, terracotta can be used at the front entrance of the office building, but that means the whole backside is corrugated tin, right? Okay, as long as at the end you meet the budget. It's the same thing with carbon. Oh yeah, you want that floor to ceiling curtain wall that disappears through the soil so it collects dirt? Absolutely, we can do that. And for all of the people in that building lying on their stomachs, they will get a view. And so, but you're going to have to trade that energy consumption off against parts of the building that are going to have higher performance, much fewer thermal bridges, et cetera. Okay. So, oh yeah, we're going to talk about retrofit. Yeah. Yeah. Someone said something about retrofit. Um, so, the good news is that we have lots of buildings that really need love and attention. <laughs> uh, many of them are, but of uh, Right. And so this is, you know, you can look at this as a real opportunity uh, as saying the building doesn't work very well. It's cold. It's not even like, well, the energy It's just like it's leaking water. It's cold. I can't get anyone to pay money to stay there because it looks that bad. Those kind of arguments. And that actually should be the argument that an existing building owner has to do major records. It's like to improve the value of their real estate. It's not a dollars for energy savings. That's long been a loser argument. It's that it's dollars to make a better building. Better buildings are worth more and you can charge more. And so anyways, these buildings can be fixed. But I want to point out that, you know, again, we're not just talking about insulation. This is a challenge when people look at building enclosure retrofits and saying, well, we're going to add some insulation. Actually, insulation is relatively late on the step list. It's like the first thing is, well, assuming it doesn't leak water, is to fix the air tightness. And then things like ventilation in many building types, you know, not having demand control heat recovery ventilation is just insane. It, the payback period is measured in two, three years. I've seen even less. So, you know, sometimes those are the things you're going to jump for. Um, and windows, you know, like you got a 40 or 50% window to wall ratio, 1920s brick concrete building. Well, fix the windows, right? Especially if they're single pane. That was our last meeting, by the way, was at a, a beautiful 1970 era office building in downtown Boston with single glazed 69, 69, 69, 69, 70, 69, 80 years. Anyway, uh, so, but it was kind of interesting, right? I mean, we were like, oh, look, it's zipper lock, zip lock gasket. It's like a single piece of glass. It's like the middle ages. Um, so, Obviously, we're going to like collect, we're going to knock those out anyway because they're just going to make the building modern and ex to, to acceptance standards, right? Might even put an emergency exit if you're really clean the building. Now, <laughs> so when we're looking, I'm going to have a, this is a more extensive list here, and I'm putting in red two things where insulation has a role in 
But all of this other stuff, I mean, that's why we that's where we get bang for buck on our enclosure retrofits. It's like, you know, make the water stop coming in. Be my hero. Uh, okay, but we'll insulate at the same time. Okay, you know, if you insist on making it comfortable and affordable, all right. But just make the water stop coming in, you know? Um, so condensation, air leaky window, water leaky windows, being able to use space that you couldn't because it was like a freezer in the wintertime and a sauna in the summertime and the argument to the tenants that on average they should be comfortable isn't cutting it in. <laughs> so again, as I said, this is well documented in a number of Rocky Mountain Institute or Department of Energy documentation at a high level. You know, you start with the existing building commissioning to make sure there are no dead raccoons in the rooftop unit, uh, stuff like that, or which we, and I have to say, routinely you find things like, oh, this hasn't been plugged in for how many decades? <laughs> um, but sometimes that's good because it saves energy. It just makes everyone sick. Um, then there's a, you know, lighting upgrades are easy, uh, various load reduction strategies on, on properly sizing motors and so on. And then we move through at the very end, you see, we always get the last filling enclosure. It's because you always leave the best to last, but it also tends to be the most expensive. But you can't look at it as expensive versus energy saving because most of it is not about energy saving. It's about making a better enclosure so that the building can perform, that people want to be in it. They will pay rent. They don't get sick. I mean, these are little features I like. Um, so obviously it's cheap to do tweaks and repairs, but hopefully it's also, you don't get much out of it. So there are some disproportionate upgrades like air tightening in some buildings that will save a meaningful amount of energy and carbon and won't cost a lot of money. But really, the kind of things that we're talking about for Berto, at least in the 10 year out level, you're going to have to do something serious. And putting weather stripping on the loading dock door ain't going to cut. It. Yeah, that's just that you should do that anyway. Um, so, this is where the retrofit and renewal, where we start replacing entire components of the facade, like windows, the roofs, or we start insulating all the okay walls, maybe doing the windows five more years down the road. Uh, when we change the mechanicals, etc. But we also see lots of opportunity in terms of, I guess, professional architects and engineers are hired when people do gut renewal, because that really is almost like a new construction project with fewer arguments about the form and massing during the, the schematic design process. <laughs> You've been in those design shreds too, right, Richard? Yeah, it's good. We don't have to argue about that anymore because the freaking concrete column is right there. Um, you can get right down to business. So now, obviously, in, in Boston, you would care about moisture sent to the facades, meaning mostly clay brick, but also potentially terracotta and some natural stones. And by that, when you retrofit, you worry about making it worse for the mixture. Uh, it's fairly obvious why one would care about that. But if we look at a typical, you know, masonry building, I'm showing one that's got like three or four lines of brick, uh, pretty thick, like some parts of this building are. Um, but, you know, we are trying to renovate those types of buildings up to the level where they are not just acceptable places to live, but they're often very desirable places, which means higher rent, which means they can afford higher fees. Yeah, that is worth that money. But anyway, uh, it would make sense that they at least are willing to spend more money on a real deep retrofit because then it's a luxury apartment with a cool vibe, right? So I hope it's obvious uh, to a building science crowd that the preferred obvious approach is you put the insula, uh, a membrane for air and water barrier on the outside, you add a shitload of rock wool, you put a cladding panel up there and you say, you know, take the award. Right. Um, this is the lowest risk approach to making a high performance building. And in fact, there are often very few drawbacks. Like they're literally from a performance aspect, this is better than you can get most new buildings. How many new building enclosures are you going to get with eight to 12 inches of masonry on the inside with a membrane on the outside? Right. 
Yeah, I want something that has a four hour fire rating and will stop a 40 caliber machine gun. <laughs> yeah, you can't afford that. Yeah, but if I buy that piece of junk bill building over there, we can do that. Uh, so, and how do I get a tremendous amount of continuous insulation with a backup strong enough that I can attach my cladding anywhere I want, right? I don't have to line up with stud. Oh, no, wherever you like, you can put hundreds of pounds of load. That's what we got with these existing buildings. So, in many ways, you know, this is this is gold, right? This is, and these buildings will therefore last, you know, another hundred years until someone figures out another problem for us to solve. But they'll be really good buildings in the meantime. Okay, so one of the ways people do this is that they uh, spray foam on the inside, um, and the foams come in different colors. And one of the things that our research has shown is that the color matters squat. Um, now. Another thing I will talk about is that uh, we've also discovered that all of this foam, even the stuff that isn't like red colored, burns. And so we have to come up with alternatives uh, to, to solve that problem. Now, your concern when we're looking at an interior insulation retrofit is that, well, if I add insulation on the inside, I am making all of this masonry cold. So most people go, well, then, oh, gosh, that, that's going to make that brick freeze. Well, actually, that brick has always been getting cold since the year it was built. And adding a bunch of insulation on the inside will make that temperature change. Yeah. And not even then. It's like even then ish uh, That's how little it is. But what it does do is it changes this brick. This brick, which has never seen, well, often they haven't seen a freezing day in their world life unless it's an abandoned building. So you know, those, those exist too, right? Especially in outskirts, you go, like, hey, look, an abandoned mill building. Let's see what the free slug test tells us. Let's walk around and look on the inside, right? Um, so, but normally this is the side we should be concerned about. And as was mentioned earlier by another group today, is that, well, this brick isn't the same as this brick, right? Uh, if, especially in older buildings, they would very carefully choose the best brick here on the front face and the worst, or at least softest, they like soft because they can attach stuff like glass and window frames and stuff to it. And then the stuff that was over fired and or soft is in the middle. But they each have different uh, responses to free soft. You know, their sensitivity will vary. Now, luckily, even though this is suddenly its world has been changed from being warm and cozy to being freezing cold all winter, it's often not getting wet enough. Uh, you know, that was the whole idea behind using multiple layers of brick, right? Is that there was enough storage capacity in relation to the uh, permeance of the masonry that the backside didn't get wet. And that's why you could look for like people expected to build a building and not have a wet inside, right? It makes sense. Um, so when you do the retrofit, your real concern is less about the outside, unless you do something stupid, like add water and concentrate it in areas. Like say use modern window sills, you know, window sills that don't project out and have drip edges and jam extensions and end and all that stuff. Yeah. So don't use modern stuff. Actually use stuff that we've been using for a few centuries with great success. Um, and that means that we don't want to concentrate on And that includes also paraffin coping, balcony railings. Uh, penetrations of all those types because of course if you concentrate water on the outside well you're kind of going to ask for trouble whether you insulate or not but if, when you insulate you are reducing the heat flow so it just makes the problem a little bit worse on the outside so first step you know deal with all the stupid shit on the outside make sure that water isn't, isn't sloping towards the building you know like that big parking lot that slopes in. You don't want it in you want it out -y. you want that water to flow away and become your neighbor's problem and so that might have to require regrading of the building. I and mean, that's not a big deal, but it's important if you don't do it. And that includes the sidewalk. And remember, landscapers have a completely different version of dimensions that you and I, you know, when you say that this is like, you know, eight feet below uh, datum, that may mean eight feet plus or minus six inches. Uh, so be aware that you're going to have, if you have landscaping here, it's going to be quite variable and you got to design for that. And ideally, he would actually put a crushed stone here or something with a drain tile so that water never sits there, even melting snow. The moment it melts, it goes down. You know how I know it goes down? Gravity. 
right? And so the trick is if I put crushed stone there, it'll keep going down rather than going into the building, right? So these are these are building science permits. Um, now, the, one of the real concerns that we have, but I can't tell you that this commonly happens, but it's a real concern, is that if air gets into the space between the insulation and the masonry, it will condense. But that's almost certain in every building that's occupied. This means I don't have to do a roofing model. I know that if there's like R10 or 15 there, it's going to be cold enough to condense in Boston in the wintertime, right? Um, okay, so it condenses and that wets the sensitive backside. I, you know, I have a sensitive backside, masonry walls have sensitive backside. So make sure that it doesn't get wet. Uh, and air flowing in there is the most likely way that that can get wet. And that's why I remember in the early days, you know, uh, I saw local consulting firms suggesting, oh, we'll put an air gap between the masonry wall and the insulation to let it breathe. What do you want, crack? It's like completely the opposite thing you would want to do. Like, well, I have no idea. I mean, like how anybody could think that that was a sensible solution. Um, but we still see this in basements, right? Locally, I mean, people are like, oh, you could put an air gap in that way. I could be sure to have a problem. And when I do, I've got a good channel to distribute all the mold because I want to share. <laughs> so you're trying to push the insulation tight to avoid that gap. And of course, you would never put a stud all the way through that because that's just the thermal bridge and puts the stud at the coldest, wettest part of the wall. Because that, so that would also be a pretty you know, bad idea. I'm trying not to say stupid. So what we would do instead, here's an example, and I, I, I've selected some of my high architecture slides to demonstrate these principles. Um, and so this is a, you know, look, there's a few of these buildings around uh, Route 128 and, and outside of the 495 ring, right? Uh, maybe a few thousand acres of these buildings. And they are also buildings that Verdo cares about, right? It's not just the museums. Um, okay, so one of the things you would do in a building like this is that you would coat it to resist water penetration with a vapor permeable water flexible coating, and also so it doesn't look like crap, right? So now the color choice here, maybe it, maybe, maybe it does look a little bit like crap, but they, they could have made other choices and you could put patterns in it and diagonal slopes and you can add a few pieces of bright blue metal or whatever, but at very little cost, you can pimp your ride uh while you add water resistance that's quite significant because these buildings often leak a fair bit of water as they get old. Um, now on the inside I'm showing oh I'm putting in a couple inches or more of closed cell spray foam in between some steel studs and drywall. Why do I put steel studs and drywall on an industrial building? I mentioned that this shit burns. Right, and so you, you want to be careful if you want to line the inside of an industrial building with the palm because there could be a source of ignition in many of these buildings. Um, and so well, the easy answer is you cover it up with steel stud and gypsum. Yes, you can use incandescent paint uh, in various types, but they're expensive and they often don't work as well as they might be advertised. Whereas gypsum board has a pretty good track record. Now, we, we kind of know what to expect. Um, now, let's say I wanted, it was a building I cared about, so I wanted to use something that uh, something like Stonewall. Um, this is a picture uh, in, in New York City. Um, this is a, a, a T wall. One of the problems of interior retrofits is that they have intersecting shear walls and floors and roofs, which means that you're going to lose a lot of the R value based on that insulation. Like, what a lot half is a good rule of thumb until you do the model. Now, if you have a wood floor, not nearly as bad. Instead, you have sleepless nights about rotting the wood. So it depends, you know, be careful what you wish for. But normally, we just have to deal with what we get. So what I'm showing is that this yellowy bit is um, a stove, uh, a stove guard. It's a liquid applied vapor permeable coating. And I'm showing you the belt suspender and clean underwear approach that we're smearing the back of the masonry with a fluid applied air and water barrier that's vapor permanent. Do I need to do that? Well, that depends. And you're going to have to make a risk reward discussion about how leaky is that wall? How likely is that wall to leak? And by leak, I mean water primarily. 
But even if it leaks any air, you're plugging those holes, period. But if you're talking water, it's like you got to make a judgment. Many of these buildings are not leaking water. But you still have to make the judgment of, is it leaking now and is it likely to leak? Versus how much does it cost to put this fluid in water? Um, the good news is that we have fewer weather-related issues with applying it here. We don't have to worry about the wind spraying it all over the neighboring parking lot. Which is very expensive because you know that stuff sticks to car paint like nobody's business. <laughs> um, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> but here on the inside, not as much of a problem. Here I've got my stone wool screwed through into the masonry with uh, wind block type screws to hold the, the insulation on. And then I have that green line, which is not the air barrier, it's a, a vapor, a smart vapor cover. Ideally, we would be doing a smart vapor cover. So why do I have to put a layer there at all? Uh, rock wool is vapor permeable. It goes like it goes through like goose through a goose, right? There's literally uh, nothing will slow down that water barrier, which can be very helpful. But in, in this case, it means that if you have any kind of relative humidity in this room, it's going to condense on the back side. How do I know that? No, I did a lot of Wolfie model. I learned basic building science when I was seven. Uh, and so that meant that you can't get in this climate zone, it ain't going to be um, possible to avoid the risk of diffusion condensation. Now, is it a big deal if I get condensation? Well, not really. But this is, again, a risk discussion you have to have with your owner. Um, so if condensation occurs there, is the masonry going to fail? Probably not from diffusion because it's such a small force. But is it good to have wet rock will stuck against masonry? You know, that might cause, there might be dirt on the masonry that starts to smell moldy or something like that. So how humid is the indoors? You know, is it a, let's say it's a rich person's lot, meaning nobody lives there. Uh, then the relative humidity might be low enough. The problem is if it's a rich person's lot, they either are a lawyer or have one. So that, oh, I am talking myself going in the other direction. So, you know, obviously, if there's any kind of humidification inside, you're going to have to do something. And if you move, move south, let's say you go down to Carolina and start chewing tobacco, then it might get warm enough that this is no longer a problem. Let's say you go into the depths of Maine. Well, then it's always going to be a problem for an occupied building if the people are breathing. Right? So, um, so that's the concern. Uh, breathing people produce moisture, condense with up really cold basin. So, smart vapor and charter. I'm showing you who the belt suspenders clean under there. This will work in essentially all situations as a design. It completely depends on your uh, execution of this, right? But it covers all the eventualities. But obviously, in a real design, you can make project specific uh, deletions and substitutions. Now, we could say replace this rock wool with that FSK stuff. You know what I'm talking about? The aluminum foil phase to provide a good vapor barrier. Well, that would stop the wintertime condensation, right? Because aluminum foil is a great vapor barrier. Okay, so what's the backside of FSK? Do you know what I'm talking about FSK? Some people are looking blindly at me. Okay. It's an aluminum foil phase rock wool widely used for decades. Um, problem is, is actually, it's not very much aluminum. It's supposed to be paper. That's what the K stands for. Craft. Kraft in German, but it's craft paper, uh, and it's on the back side that gives the strength for that aluminum. And so in the summertime, water vapor, the reason we're choosing this to be vapor permeable is to let the water vapor blow back out, right? And so now it comes out and it condenses on the back of the paper. What is that, Joe, that story about uh, paper, water, back? Right, yeah, I think that's the way it works. And so this is actually now a fantastic way of growing mold. Uh, you know, that stuff grows mold faster than like a Petri dish. Um, and so that would be a bad idea unless you were in a really cold place where you never got inward vapor drives, like Barrow, Alaska. So when you're doing your masonry retrofits there, keep that as a good solution in mind. So one of the challenges with this design is that is how do you attach the smart vapor retarder to the base of the rock wall? And uh, so here I'm showing you the, 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 the clip to hold the, uh, the rock wall on. And then this is a, a screw, you know, button head screw that screws to that metal clip. And uh, so this is just a, a job locked up for the project in Ontario. But 
You don't have to make this thing airtight. That's being held by that fluid membrane supported by a really strong masonry. But you do want to stop those convection loops. You don't want to have a gap. And that's not too big of a risk if the insulation is tight in the wall. But we find that people, depending on the roughness of the wall, there's, there's bumps and wiggles. And sometimes there's accidental channels that run top to bottom that we're worried about. And using the smart vapor retarder to, to, as a convection suppressor to stop that moving is desirable. Any questions about that? I mean, I just pointed that as sort of a, yeah. It's smart. Oh, what makes it smart? It's actually not very smart, but it's a marketing term. Uh, and it means that it's, uh, it's closed down when the relative humidity is lower inside the building, which equates to winter in Massachusetts. And as the relative humidity rises around it, because water vapor is coming in from the outside, and because it's summer in Massachusetts, it becomes vapor only. So it allows water vapor to dry to the inside and won't trap it, but it also stops water vapor from going out in cold weather. Does that make sense? I, I, you know, other people, you must have seen, some of you must have seen water vapor there. Yes. Uh, would you not, not think that closed cell might be a simpler solution? Would I not think that closed cell spray foam wouldn't be a simpler solution? Yeah, but it burns. So you, again, you just have to pick your clients. Uh, who, who care about that or don't care? With your drywall on the inside. With your drywall. You know, that, so that's that was the thing. It was the year two thousand solution, right? A couple inches of spray foam, still spread drywall. But uh, you know, the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, as an example, or the GSA, are people who say, "Yeah, I don't want spray. Uh, it burns." Right. And also, we also have, for example, Princeton, where our buildings are precious. You can't have insulation stick to them because then it would be less precious. Uh, and so you can't actually stick your insulation. You have to have be able to disassemble the insulation. I think it might also come from their history of many buildings being built wrongly and they've often had to disassemble them. I, I don't know the historical basis for it, but uh, they want to continue to build buildings that we can disassemble. Uh, and so, okay, we can do that. You know that only 80% of what I say is true, right? <laughs> so beautiful buildings like this give us the opportunity for exterior retrofits and while interior retrofits occupy the imagination of building scientists everywhere we have we have fond dreams of doing interior retrofits i'd say a lot of the real work that needs done is exterior retrofits and we shouldn't um, we shouldn't ignore that to say that that actually is what we're going to make a difference on, on that. we make it more fees and more personal involvement on an interior retrofit, but we're going to make bigger bank for buck impacts on more buildings on fixing pieces of junk like this, right? Now, the, the, I mentioned this botched water repellent coating because, again, it's, it's a classic building. You know, it, it could be in Boston, right? You know, exposed concrete frame, brick in the middle. Uh, it leaks rainwater only when it rains, the occupants reassure us. Um, and that kind of, you know, okay, we're going to have to do something significant to fix this building. I mean, it looks terrible, but it doesn't even work right. So we're, you know, it's hard. Okay, so we have to do something. Uh, so exterior rep eaves, exterior insulated finish systems, um, are actually literally were designed for this, right? That, by BASF after the Second World War, uh, thanks to the American Air Force, they had a lot of burned out masonry buildings that they needed to quickly make energy efficient retrofits because they didn't have a lot of energy. And actually, there's a mold angle to this as well, is that they recognized that if they didn't insulate them, they got moldy because people couldn't afford to heat them properly. So they kept them cold, they had lots of mold growth at the corner, and plaster was falling off. And so they said, look, insulate on the outside, give them a new stucco look, change the texture and color, whatever you like, and here's the system. And uh, so that's what, you know, when it came to America, it was, look at the colors. Look at the colors. We can do lots of colors and we can make fun shapes and we can make it look like a duck. Um, so that was how in the 70s, drive it made market penetrations. And it wasn't about, oh, it insulates and airtight stuff. So by the 90s, as it became more popular for other buildings, they discovered that, oh, it also leaks lots of rainwater at joints and penetrations if you're not careful. And so we have the whole debacle that has led us to well, where we are today. We're much smarter. Um, and these companies have a lot of money. So uh, this is an example of a piece uh, made of stone wool. Uh, again, why stone wool? Because it doesn't burn, but it doesn't have to be stone wool. 
is more, uh, it's common to use expanded polystyrene, the white beadboard stuff. Uh, there's even products that use polyisol, although very few. Be careful, there's not as much support for that. Um, and you have to also be careful about there are even a few uh, that use extruded. But actually, you want the insulation layer that you choose to be gushy. Now, I'm trying not to use too much jargon in this presentation, <laughs> but what we want to have is that it has to be flexible enough that as it expands and contracts, it doesn't cause stress concentrations at board joints. And so EPS is soft enough to do that, as is rock wool. When it comes to things like polyiso, they have to use special details at joint line and so on, or higher levels of mesh reinforcement to stop the cracking. So it's not, I mean, we've had projects in the past where people have said, oh, I'm going to do you a favor. We'll upgrade this. But no, upgrade it. Uh, so it's pretty obvious. You have your masonry wall, add your air water vapor membrane, and put on your insulation, preferably with a drainage gap, because we know we can, although we also know we can get away with it. Right, Wayne? I mean, you can build lots of buildings with face sealed yeast over masonry, and no one will notice that it leaves. And it's not just, we don't just have North American experience, almost all of Europe did this. They still don't understand why are we putting drainage behind these? Because, well, they're starting to understand because they're building more wood frame buildings. And so they're literally living North Carolina all over again. Um, in Sweden, it was 2010, Iceland 2014. In Germany, it's been a bit slower moving because they don't change as quickly. But yeah, yeah, you put heat over wood framing, and guess what? You have a high percentage of rot. Unless you put this thing we call a water resistive barrier over the sheathing before you add the heat system. So putting it over masonry, though, to be fair, it can handle the small amounts of water. And so it is a very low risk, but we've now developed the drain system to such an art that it actually isn't that expensive to have a drain EIFS system. Um, in many cases, the stonewall systems are literally just putting in a, a flashing at the bottom of the water that inevitably breaks down. I mean, drainage occurs in these tight gaps. So that building I showed you before, here we are in the restoration phase. Um, so we, you know, at this stage, it's got sort of the uh, the style of like East German gray. Uh, and, uh, but we've got four inches of insulation here. And I want to point, this is an almost a 10 year old project and it was a battle to get four inches of foam on it, even though the Delta from doing two inches, which they're used to doing, was like, it's almost, you know, they're spending more on mobilization than the entire upgrade for this building to go from two to four inches. But they're still arguing, I don't know, it's really, really, man. that's why I have to stand, okay? So we're doing the four inches. Um, anyway, uh, so we started with this, we end up with this. And to my, this is an example of a building which, to my shock, the property managers hadn't had said, we have to do this and we want to do it right, and change the windows and do the skin. But it was, to me, what was shocking is that they hadn't really thought that they were going to change their rental agreement much. You know, so they were, you know, charging X dollars. And they were, you know, I ran into them at a conference about a year later, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's yeah, great. And we can jack the rents up 300 bucks a month, and we're fuller than we've ever been. And it's like, oh, well, that's really got to help the pro forma. Oh, God, yeah, I'm going to pay this whole thing in a few years. Um, it's like, you didn't think of that, like, when you started? Like, astonishingly, they did not. And to Maria, your comment about working with mechanical systems and such, another cool story about this building was that, they, as part of the renovation of this old building, they installed new high efficiency HVAC two years before they did the enclosure, right? So they, they spent a lot of money with condensing boilers, three of them on the roof, they were staged, you know, to sequence, start uh, one after another, and then eventually come up with equal run times, all that kind of cool stuff. Well, the problem was is that the third boiler never ran. Right, and they knew that the third boiler didn't run when they went up because the second boiler wouldn't start on one of the colder nights of the year. And it's like, oh shit, we've been running the whole winter on one boiler, and we're just now discovering that the second boiler won't kick on because it had never run before. And that's when they made sure they checked the third boiler. Oh yeah, that wasn't going to work either. So basically, they're saying, no one needs a boiler. <laughs> you know, all you need is a crane. We'll get it down for you. But um, so 
that this is about the sort of the, the whole point about choosing the right order of things, right? And in retrofits, that's pretty key. Are we doing the windows and then the walls, the walls and the windows? Do we do the windows and then the HVAC and the walls? Thinking this out in terms of also Berto and the staged amount of carbon emissions, how it fits into the relative age and whether, I think there's a lot of choices to be made. And they're not very much about whether I'm using a drain eaves or face hitters. So I've said in many things in building science, the order matters. You know, like you can pick your nose, pick your butter, pick your teeth, but the order really matters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, there are lots of these buildings out there for which this is a completely reasonable solution. And it's not just that you're adding insulation. That's almost the least important feature of these other things. Uh, you know, the comfort, the new look, the stopping the rain leaks, all of those things are worth lots of money that should be worth doing this. And the consequence is, yes, now we can we can, we can slot in our Virto upgrades for mechanicals and it won't be a terrible experience. Yes, it'll spend money, but you're going to make a better building. And in many cases, I think it makes a lot of sense to get your money back. So, but building enclosure specialists, need to know about, well, we gotta show some details. And so the key issue here is that we need to do a lot of window details and balcony details. Now my preferred balcony detail involves a large concrete saw. Um, and then you just go along where the patio door is, you know, <laughs> until it falls off. And it really makes it a lot easier to add insulation and your energy numbers go really improved. Um, and so, Coming up with solutions to the balcony, I would argue, is an unsolved problem. I've seen architects come up with ways of turning them into Julia balconies that make sense. So, and why are we sawing these balconies off? Not to really save energy. Many times we're sawing them off because they're going to fall off. If they're 50 years old and they were poured with three quarter inch concrete cover uh, and the rebar's at the top, right? Because it's a cantilever balcony, it's like those things are corroded. They're, they're, we have standard prices in Toronto for how much it costs per foot, well, actually per meter, of uh, balcony replacement because it's just a standard thing when buildings get to a certain age. Uh, and so uh, I think that's not a solved problem. It's expensive to replace them with thermally broken balconies, but possible. Um, also, we're seeing prefab balconies that are made relatively lightweight, like aluminum ones that you can hold on after you saw off the offending old one. But there's a lot of these variations where I think, I don't have a solid answer yet, that's a good bang for Bob, or, or a slam dunk solution. Uh, but, but the windows, I think we know how to do windows, right? I mean, we're putting uh, some sort of flashing in, we're trying to line up the insulation line and the window with the insulation line and the retrofit. Those are all the building science details. This is actually off of a real project that I'm gonna show you some pictures of, uh, of windows being replaced in a university building. They weren't going to use eaves until the structural engineer told them that their load allowance for the retrofit was something like three pounds a square foot. And it's, uh, and it's like, shit, I don't know if I want to go up the scaffolding on that project. But anyway, um, this is the building. It used to look like, well, it didn't have this color. It was, it was brick with white concrete accents. And the whole thing was coated with an air and water barrier. You can see there are new windows installed and the red around them is taped to protect them from splatter from the, the, the fluid of light memory, right? And by the way, fluid of light memory also stick to glass really well. <laughs> uh, so here you see the, the original brick on the base of wall. Base of wall insulation, you're using uh, uh, a extruded insulation, cement board over top, you're gonna put synthetic stuff over it to make it look like concrete. Then there's the air and water barrier above. You can see the flashing that's already pre-installed at grade level. New windows. Um, this is uh, this is how they installed the first window. Uh, so it's not like they didn't have some sort of flashing, but then they had the wood shims that penetrated all the way to the inside with the wood in the wet zone. And uh, but you know, but can I just put some more caulking in there? No, no you can't put more caulking in there. Um, so yeah, that's why I think the windows need to our constant attention is because even when you design a drawing like they showed there, it's like they end up doing stuff like this where you then have to you know, go with a stick and a dog. Um, so there you go, that's what it looked like at the end. This used to be brick, this used to be precast concrete, but all the same texture was bred through on this building. 
um, except now it is four to six inches of additional insulation on the other side. Um, and a key aspect of this is often, uh, I know I can do a lot of the work from the outside, uh, but I'm, I'm going to disrupt the inside when I replace the windows. Again, back to windows. And so thinking through the construction sequencing is important. This happens to be a library. This is the second floor of that building. And so it wasn't actually that big of a deal to put up some studs with polyethylene sheet. It's a great use for poly. Um, and it was just providing a room for people to take the windows out from the outside, put new windows in. Somebody came in after the poly was removed and did the interior cockpits and all that. And it's just not that big a deal. Like that's why there's all this, this move towards oh, we need prefabricated exterior enclosure retrofits. Why? I, I, again, I just don't see the compelling reason. People say, oh, we gotta get it done really quickly. Why? We waited 60 years. <laughs> I, you know, is it okay if we do it in like six months? Oh, we'll disrupt the, the occupants. Really? I don't know. I, I, I'm not gonna disrupt the occupants. I mean, yeah, they can't walk around naked if they're shy, but that's about it. <laughs> And even then, if they're shot. Okay, um, I, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it quits there. I, I was looking for some questions. I'm not gonna show you some of the, the weirder solutions. Uh, are there, I'm giving you some careful time to think about questions. And still, no questions. <laughs> what are you, an undergraduate class? Come on. And that detail didn't show me the plastic and yeah. the metal. Yeah. So why are you the green off side of the... Oh, well, why is the green off? It's just that because I'm, I'm uh, not me, but the train is screwing that plastic headed screw into the metal plate. I can't hit the middle. So the metal plate is installed to hold the insulation in place. And then somebody comes back and unrolls the smart paper retarder and needs a place to attach the smart paper retarder. So yeah, and it does, it could, you can come up with other ways by all means. It's just that it's, that's sort of, I'm showing you a way that we've used now on several projects that's worked. Um, but, and I wish I had a bet, like let's, wouldn't it be great if I had a Stonewall product with a built-in smart paper retarder? Wow, that would be like your cat's meow. <laughs> if only I knew someone at Rockford. <laughs> they may be listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not confirm or deny. Somebody might be listening. Somebody might be listening. Yeah. 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 Oh, so why is the mask grid? Well, the mask grid actually isn't so bad. It's kind of in the middle of the sky. But uh, when we make electricity, we're burning some fossil fuels, some hydro, some um, nuclear. Now, the mask grid, there's not a lot of nuclear in there, and it's a lot of natural gas and some hydrogen. 60% says this gentleman right here. I believe you, I, I shift their face convinced by that. <laughs> um, anyway, and so it's only about a 35% efficient process. So the, you, you, that's why you know the big cooling towers you see, and the fact they put power plants next to the OT, because most of the stuff, most of the energy in nuclear or natural gas is heat. If we're really lucky, the latest technology we can get into low 40% recycled uh, natural gas, we can get 40%. Into electricity, and that results in carbon. And the reason we expect it to get cleaner over time, and numbers going to drop. Well, we're replacing coal has pretty much been removed. Uh, we're making natural gas. We're replacing it with wind and photovoltaics. And uh, if some of your state, northern state borders would cooperate, we've got a power line from Quebec that is incredibly low carbon power down here, right? I don't know if, how many of you know what I'm talking about, but. Um, yeah, so that's why I think it's it is a, it's pretty clear that's the path for water. See the natural gas, you're burning it right on site, right? So you're putting in a 92% water. And that's why, you know, but you use electricity to heat pump, boom, you kick natural gas as butt. Even though it comes into the building with high carbon, you're getting a lot more heat out of it than you buy, and so you win. Yeah. Yeah, John, while we're talking about the grid. 
I remember we had dialogues back long ago saying that nuclear is not the answer uh, just because of the problem of disposal of waste. Are you still in the same mindset as, you know, it is carbon free, but, you know, it has to get stopped. Well, first of all, it's not carbon free any more than PD is, but it is a low carbon energy source. Yeah. Okay, that's a good thing. Now, but the, but the problem is, as you may have noticed, I still have some hope as a technology nuclear geek, and you, somebody from MIT, that one day we're going to crack the nut, right? We're going to figure out how to make safe nuclear power cheap. But we just, we haven't figured that out yet. There's some hope in small modular reactors, but it's literally, it's just, you know, how often have we been burned about, oh, it's going to be inexpensive. Oh, too cheap to meter, right? And it's now like literally one of the most expensive sources of energy at almost everywhere on the planet. So I guess, you know, I, the waste problem is, is a real thing. <laughs> uh, you know, there are some small safety concerns, but I think actually, relative probability and all that. Uh, but I just think that right now it's been, for the last decade, it's been to say, it just costs too much. And frankly, Rockwell's cheap, right? I mean, like, I mean, seriously, if you look at how much the cost to build a nuclear plant to provide the power to run a heat pump, or how much the cost to insulate, it's like, son of a bitch, that insulation is pretty cheap. You know, I used to say insulation is dirt cheap until I started buying dirt. So if you go to the gardening center, dirt is not cheap, right? You want it cheap, buy some insulation. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, there's sort of change in performance, uh, looking at the performance of the system, if you will trigger over Changes in, in, in uh, for instance, access bitter, where a safety building is from accessible to be able to get some they can give you a system. You don't follow up with water and say you're going to make it, that's your function, even with uh, means of people where they don't know, say, anything like that. So, is there any chance that we're going to start moving into that direction for all the other components? Of I'm not for sure if everybody heard, but Leonardo is basically saying. What other changes might occur because of the existing building having to change in each Vertigo 2.0, including things like fire escapes, fire laws, uh, accessibility, ADA compliance. And um, wow, like you're definitely a can of worms opener, aren't you? Uh, so I don't, I, I certainly have no insight into that. I think it's a completely valid thought. Uh, I think there's going to be, as written now, there's a lot of uh, concerns that I think building owners have about, well, if I do a small change, at what point will they require me to follow the new stretch code? And do I then have to go to an exception with a stretch code because it's going to be really difficult for me to meet these rather demanding targets? And frankly, it might even be worse in five years, right? Because that's when the first step comes down a Berto. And by then, the stretch code might have been really stretched. And it's like, so I think that that is not a resolved question. And I, but, but I believe it is critical that existing buildings be managed. They are going to be a major part of all of the buildings, not just in Massachusetts, but in America. And so we're going to have to come up with better ways of having flexible answers to these questions. So it's a completely valid answer and challenge. Well, sure, uh, and that's why I would rather not be. You know, do you want another? I want to go before the tribunal and convince my you know, like more paperwork and, and more time delays and more permits, or would it be nice to have it more written down in the legislation that eighty or ninety percent of the existing building cases that have problems can be managed? Uh, so, but I, I think these are. I, this is an uncertainty. I hadn't thought about accessibility and fire. That's a really good one. Uh, but I thought about a lot of these other things. At some point, if I replace the windows, are they going to make me follow the new stretch code? Because I, or do I have to do the whole enclosure because I do the windows, including the roof? And the answer is, it doesn't seem that anyone has a definitive answer. And and, there, and that needs to be cleared up by intelligent people asking questions like you, Tony. In response to that, uh, it's actually just like. The other aspects of the building code. That's something that has really spooked a bunch of people with new energy code coming out. 
Does this mean I need to do a complete energy retrofit? And it's actually just like the accessibility of the If more than half of the building is in the area of work, you're probably going to have to do the whole building as far as energy upgrade. If less than half, then you probably only the half that's within that area of work would have to be the requirements. If you're not touching any doors or windows, you probably don't need to do anything. But if you're replacing the mechanical system, you're probably going to have to meet the energy requirements. So it's going to be definitely a tricky minefield. We're all it's going to be definitely not definite, I hear you saying, Tony, but, but you do seem to have a sense that based on your experience, is that actually may not be as disastrous as all that and people are used to making these calls. That's what you're saying. But for railroad, you'll have to report energy. Right? Energy. But you're not reporting uh, an accessible with building you don't. So you don't get penalized when building with no penalized. but if, if you make if you make a big enough change to meet Ferdo, you might fall under that 50% requirement. Oh, I think that's right. what that's okay. Well, but otherwise, they're, they're, they're actually being. They are connected. Yeah, they are connected. <laughs> well, they could very well be, depending again on whether you have any other tricks up your sleeve for meeting Virgo. Right. Yeah. Money spent on buildings, improvements. It's the, existing, it's the international existing building code that sets out the work program and the value of that work. And it's very clear in the international existing building code, whether it's a bathroom, a handicap ramp, windows, whatever you're spending on money on the building, it's the value of the building, the overall that comes plugging into that. So that's the greater of it. That's where I would look and suggest everyone to get familiar with the international existing building code. And there are various replacing in time. You put down beaded board, replace the beaded board. If you put something else in interior, I'm just thinking, yeah. okay. put something else, put for my whatever. I've had people floor it by the time. Like, how much what's your work area? The dollars and work area goes down. So that's where that's where one looks for all of this. I think you should have a back session on how do you deal with navigating code on existing buildings. I mean, there are people who might know something about this, meaning not me, uh, that would probably be, but you could be, I can see how it's practical and useful to have some of these answers and somebody showing you code clauses, and, et cetera. Seems to me it's what we need to know to be able to practice. Very much so. I agree. So I don't know when we get kicked out of here or something like that, or uh, if it's until the booze is gone, in which case we should probably get one of the booze because there's still some left. Um, all right, well, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs>